throughout human history, we have searched the stars, looking for clues to answer the ageless question, are we alone in the universe? Could there be something out there interested in visiting us? Flying saucers have invaded our planet. Without a doubt, there is one place on Earth that extraterrestrial life forms have not only visited, but are doing so more and more often. And that place is Hollywood. Are these alien movies mere entertainment? Or could they possibly hold a mirror to the truth? Join us as we witness the scientific inspiration for Hollywood's fantasies. Discover how filmmakers envision their alien creatures. Wham! Something hit me. And compare eyewitness accounts of alien abductions with the on-screen portrayals of these terrifying events. Whoa. Prepare yourself for a close encounter as aliens invade Hollywood. Welcome to Earth. Movie Magic presents... Aliens Invade Hollywood. I used to go off reading all the, you know, the UFO sightings and this, that, and the other thing. You're always excited when you hear about it, and you always expect the fact that the government's covering stuff up and all that. You always want that to be, don't you? I mean, don't you want there to be people who are smarter than we are somewhere in the universe? Nye County, Nevada. This desolate desert landscape is the home of a top secret United States military base. An installation as mysterious as its name, Area 51. We now know that the U.S. Air Force tested the F-117 stealth fighter and other super-secret aircraft right here. But many believe something far more phenomenal has been spotted in these skies. They allege the U.S. government is using Area 51 to rebuild and fly a crashed alien spaceship. Just ask the people who live near the base. Well, my feeling on a lot of it, that it's craft that our government is working together with alien beings on them. So whether they're actually crashed ships that have come here, ships that have just come, some we've redone, or our own technology that we've learned from the beings and we're back engineering is a good probability. Whatever is happening here is shrouded in secrecy. Travel is forbidden on all roads leading to the installation. Cameras capture movement of any who dare approach the site. These photographs of the base are the closest any civilian has come to documenting what is going on inside Area 51. Today, the site from which these photos were taken is off limits to the public. Trespassers risk death. But that didn't stop Hollywood. Welcome to Area 51. In the science fiction blockbuster, Independence Day, movie audiences see what the planet's most mysterious bunker might look like. Independence Day was the first Hollywood feature to present Area 51. The film's co-writer and producer, Dean Devlin, believes this is a key to its success. There's a certain type of uh, mythology about UFOs that people already know. I mean, in our film, as soon as we mention Area 51, a good half of the audience already knows what it is before we even explain it. Anyone who wants to do science fiction today, they have to build on what's been done in the past. So what you try to do is build on pre-existing mythology and then take it one step further. Cut. And cut. For one of Area 51's surprises, 
Director Roland Emmerich used a 60-foot tall mock-up of a captured alien craft. The extraterrestrial spaceship and its underground bunker were designed by art directors Oliver Scholl and Patrick Tatopoulos after conducting extensive research on Area 51. We spoke to people, we got a lot of reference. That was a very important thing for us, is try to grab as much information as possible. And Area 51 is a very magical place, nobody knows about it. Several sources told Tatopoulos of huge truckloads of cement being taken into Area 51. With this in mind, Tetopolis designed a bunker with concrete walls. On the scale, what we did on the set is we made sure that the actual design and the architecture of the underground world would reflect the fact that it's underground. ID4 goes on to reveal the mysteriously shaped alien pilots that some allege are vaulted in Area 51. Other movies have also lifted the veil of conspiracy that follows extraterrestrial creatures. In Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, a group of scientists and government operatives secretly rendezvous with a massive spaceship at Devil's Tower, Wyoming. Could these movie fantasies be shedding light on the truth? Is our government covering up the evidence of extraterrestrials? The evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some, underline the some 18 times, some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Most are not. I don't care about that. Stanton Friedman is a nuclear physicist. In the 1950s and 60s, he worked on highly classified U.S. government projects to develop nuclear-powered aircraft. At the same time, he privately began research on UFO sightings. After years of tracking top secret documents, he is certain that our government is withholding evidence of extraterrestrial visitors. The subject of flying saucers represents a kind of cosmic Watergate, meaning some few people within governments have known since 1947 that aliens are visiting. UFO researchers point to a series of incidents in 1947 as ground zero for the government cover-up. On July 8th of that year, the U.S. Army base at Roswell, New Mexico, reported finding a flying saucer. At a ranch 75 miles northwest of Roswell, what apparently happened was a mid-air collision between two flying saucers. This was in the middle of a huge wave of sighting. One researcher has collected uh, over 2,000 reports from 1947. So it was headline stuff all over the country. The Army quickly recanted. They said debris recovered at Roswell was simply a weather balloon. In 1994, Air Force investigators announced the debris was really a spy satellite. But by then, charges of a cover-up had grown to include reports of recovered alien pilots. Now I get a strange question. Where could they hide? the bodies and the wreckage from Roswell and any other crashes. My goodness, if you can hide 30,000 nuclear warheads and all kinds of chemical and biological material, you can certainly hide a few bodies and a few pieces of wreckage. Also, people tend to forget that there are places in the United States, Area 51 being one, that you cannot fly over them. They'll shoot you down if you don't go away when they get up close to you. Keeping secrets is easy. In the absence of absolute facts, Hollywood has stepped in to provide possible scenarios. Detection protocol, now! In the science fiction thriller, The Arrival, a radio astronomer, played by Charlie Sheen, picks up a signal of extraterrestrial origin. Jumping ahead to phase three, second source verification. Government superiors who stop his research are, in fact, Aliens intent on taking over the planet from a secret subterranean base. In real life, most scientists dismiss the idea the government is concealing the existence of extraterrestrials. It just strikes me as an improbability on top of an improbability based on a premise that doesn't make too much sense, namely that the government is keeping the most interesting scientific story of the millennium from every scientist and every uh, member of the populace. And by the way, they haven't done a very good job of it either, have they? Seth Shostak is an astronomer with SETI, 
the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. He has spent much of his life scanning the heavens for signs of alien activity. Obviously, I think that the cosmic company is out there. I think they're there. I don't think they're here, but I think they're, they're definitely there. And this is our best shot at finding them. That best shot is called Project Phoenix. This ambitious program is eavesdropping on the 1,000 stars closest to Earth. From a 140-foot diameter radio telescope, isolated in the hills of West Virginia. Radio astronomy is just astronomy by other means, if you will. This gargantuan construction behind me is a telescope in every sense, except that it operates at radio waves. So there's a big reflector, collects the radio energy. There are numerous receivers that amplify that energy, and, and we study the result. A major challenge for SETI is figuring out where to aim the telescope. After all, there are more than 100 billion stars in just our galaxy alone. We, of course, don't know in which direction ET might be situated, so we have to try lots of different directions. And a couple times a day, you do have to check something out. And one of these times, that checkout procedure will, uh, will last long enough to convince us that we found ET. It is just that scenario that has made SETI astronomers popular players in Hollywood's dramatizations. The SETI program is often depicted in science fiction films. Usually we're functioning as a distant early warning system for the, for the aliens who've decided to come down to our planet and wreak havoc and destruction. And normally we only detect them when they're not very far away. I think uh, in Independence Day, the uh, SETI project finds them at the distance of the moon. Well, we're looking a lot farther away than the moon. I hope we can do better than that. It's hard to give the SETI specialists, I call them cultists, because SETI really stands for silly effort to investigate. It's hard to give them the name science. They have consistently misrepresented the data about interstellar travel, trips to nearby stars are feasible, and they have consistently ignored the data about flying saucers. I think that if there was the slightest bit of real evidence for that, you would see some benefit. I mean, our Air Force would have planes that were 100 times better than anybody else's planes. None of that is true. So there's been no benefit from it either, except maybe for Hollywood. Even though the data may still be scientifically debatable, Hollywood has always led the way in keeping the subject of extraterrestrials in the public eye. I mean, I grew up on these movies, and, and, and there was a million of them, you know, and I'd see every one. And I, I think it just happens in waves. I also think at the end of the millennium, it's just people kind of go kind of crazy and nutty and get all like everything's, you know. Movies have always told stories of extraterrestrials. In 1902, pioneering French filmmaker Georges Melier amazed audiences with his depiction of space travel in A Trip to the Moon. Melier's Earthling explorers were taken prisoner by a strange race of crustacean-headed creatures called the Selenites. But the Selenites have a fatal weakness. They explode when they are struck. The early astronauts make their escape using their umbrellas as weapons. There was a very naive quality to what aliens would look like, how they behave, what their relationship was with humans. Generally, prior to World War II, aliens were um, fairly simplistic, almost comical, um, not uh, taken very seriously by either the filmmakers or the audiences. Robert Skotak is a Hollywood visual effects supervisor and an Academy Award winner for his spectacular miniatures in the science fiction classics Aliens and Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Skotak's fascination with the alien invasion genre began with his earliest movie experiences. This could be the beginning of the end for the human race. Well, when I saw The War of the Worlds, it had a tremendous impact. It was a very impressive film. I was five years old at the time, and it inspired a tremendous hunger to see more of this type of impressive special effects. Is there nothing that can stop the Martian death machines? Guns, tanks, bombs, they're like toys against them. 
1953, this classic H.G. Wells story of invading Martians was adapted by legendary filmmaker George Pal. The movie raised the standards of special effects and fueled Hollywood's interest in portraying extraterrestrials. Well, the War of the Worlds was uh, quite a success when it came out. It caused a big stir in the industry. You are now inside a flying saucer. Our destination, the planet Earth. We are the Mysterians. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of much lower budget producers kind of jumped on the bandwagon and made a bunch of films that were frankly terrible and kind of gave the genre a bad name. Swooping down from outer space, blowing up from the A recurring theme in these films had aliens coming to take over our planet. I think what started the alien invasion craze in the 50s was probably the uh, UFO reports that were starting to appear in the late 40s and the early 50s. Having come out of World War II, the whole notion of the U.S. being subject to outside invasion of some type seemed very fresh and very frightening to people. Something that was added to that particular mix was our fear of the communist countries with their uh, secret police. And I think the whole notion of the Red Scare developed from fusing this fear of the communist countries, the UFOs that we're hearing reports about, as well as the fact that we had experienced massive warfare. So they all fed into the sort of hopper and created this genre of films. Even the most sensational stories took inspiration from real world events. The 1954 film, This Island Earth, based the design of its spaceship on photographs of a UFO taken by a Brazilian photojournalist. If you look at the production drawings, they're actually very close to the photographs that were taken in Brazil. So that's a case of Hollywood going off of what seemed to be a very valid sighting at the time. Around the same time, Air Force engineers began testing experimental craft that bore a striking resemblance to movie images of alien spaceships. Air Force interest in this vehicle began in 1955. These experimental aircraft were not necessarily proof the government was using alien technology, but these images helped fuel the idea that the entire truth regarding flying saucers was not being revealed. The earliest film to deal with uh, UFO cover-ups and government conspiracy was a small, uh, low-budget film called Invasion of the Saucermen, produced in 1957 uh, by American International. Right in the middle of the film, a little military uh, group goes out to the wooded area and immediately proceeds to destroy the ship and bury it and cover up all trace of it. Only this special unit and the President of the United States will know what happened here tonight. You mean you think we know what's happened? Made 10 years after the Roswell incident, Invasion of the Saucer Men is fondly remembered by its effects assistant, Bob Burns. But it's just such a totally unique design for a saucer. And what's really kind of cool is it still actually works. For 40 years, Burns has proudly displayed in his studio the two-foot model spaceship used in the film and the alien head he wore for close-up shots. This is 57 now. Roswell was in the 40s, not that far back. When they wrote the script, somebody had to have heard something about that because they did do this, this government, this military cover-up of when the saucer lands and they end up blowing it up, trying to get inside of it. And they tell the police, oh, one of our jet planes crashed, which is like an old story. We've heard that many, many times. A government conspiracy is not the only theory touched on in these movies. Over the years, Hollywood has presented intriguing reasons for why extraterrestrials might be visiting. Something is happening. In the 1950s, a few films suggested that some aliens were not only peaceful, but their superior wisdom might help humankind. I came here to give you these facts. But if you threaten to extend your violence, this earth of yours will be reduced to a burned out cinder. By the late 1970s, after the political fallout from the Vietnam War and Watergate, movies began to portray aliens as more trustworthy than our human leaders. 
One thing that we've seen emerge a lot is the idea that there is a reason to hide facts about UFO visitation. Certainly, Close Encounters touches on the government trying to suppress it long enough until they can find out what these aliens want. Hollywood's shifting attitudes towards otherworldly species can clearly be seen in the influential Star Trek saga. Perhaps today is a good day to die. Prepare for running speed! In the old Star Trek, the Klingons were definitely the enemy, and now we've seen a change where Klingons are now working with human beings. This intergalactic detente was a welcome development for Worf's human counterpart, Michael Dorn. Worf, from the very beginning, started out to be egotistical about his, his own race. And then he discovered that they weren't all they were cracked up to be. And he always knew that he was better than humans, but there are some parts of human beings that are worth hanging on to. Who are you? I am the Borg. Released at the approach of a new millennium, Star Trek First Contact presents the once human-like, now biomechanical, Borgs as its most sinister villain. The Borg have a collective consciousness. I'm endeavoring to become more human. Human. We used to be exactly like them. Flawed. Weak. Organic. But we evolved to include the synthetic. The power of these fantastic stories shouldn't be dismissed, according to no less an authority than Star Trek's Captain Picard. Star Trek is epic in scale. Um, it's mythological. Um, it's deeply serious and deeply entertaining. It puts out a strong affirmative message about humankind. Prepare to evacuate the Enterprise. A Star Trek was very thoughtful in terms of how societies at different levels of development interact with each other. If we should ever meet extraterrestrials, how would they treat us? If we're to judge other species by human history, the answer may not be comforting. If you look at civilizations like those that existed here in the Americas or in the South Sea Islands, when they were first visited by other civilizations, namely Europeans, it didn't usually work out too well for them. It is indeed typical that you are people refuse to believe in the superiority of any world but your own. Until we know how alien creatures might treat humanity, the movies will keep us guessing. I am the Borg. Invaders from Mars. We're fantastic beings of a super intelligence. Imagining what an alien species might look like is a science fiction given. Most early depictions were distinctly humanoid. They were forced, I think, because of the technology to do a, a kind of a basic approach that you might do in a, that the Ziegfeld Follies or the Mardi Gras might do, which is something kind of decorative and wild and just strange. And they all had to be built around a human form. So the creatures tended to look like two arms, two legs, a head, you know, human-like. On occasion, Hollywood aliens took on a vastly different type of molecular structure. The Martians in the War of the Worlds, with their electronic eye, seem to be a movie commentary on the big screen's new rival, television. In 1977, George Lucas revitalized the science fiction genre with Star Wars. One of its most memorable scenes took place in the cantina, an alien bar. I didn't really worry about too much about how I was going to do anything when I wrote it. I knew I'd figure out a way uh, which is usually the way you do it when you write. You have to tell a very good story and you focus on that and you don't worry about the practical aspects of it too much until you get finished with it. But once I got finished with writing Star Wars and I began to look around about who would do it, you know, how would I get this accomplished, I realized that there was no special effects industry at all. To help visualize his fictional worlds, Lucas turned to visionary artist Ralph McQuarrie. Going into outer space is an adventure it's got to be more exciting than climbing a mountain or hang gliding or any other sort of putting yourself on the line adventure that I can imagine. The freedom it gives you to fantasize traveling from one planet to another, meeting aliens, which is always a fascinating idea. While Macquarie's alien creatures were impressively diverse, 
Even the oddest share a resemblance to animal and insect species known to Earthlings. I think you're always looking for something that is going to be a little interesting and different, but also something that people can relate to. If it was possible to come up with something totally different, <laughs> completely different, uh, and nobody would know what it was. To design a creature that would stand out in any crowd, the producers of the Alien film series turned to Swiss surrealist H.R. Giger. Among those who testify to the alien's power is its most frequent opponent, Sigourney Weaver. Well, actually, I find the alien quite beautiful. The Giger designs are very um, extraordinary. Um, uh, for some reason, the alien has... I never really spend time with the guy playing the alien. I don't want to get used to, like, seeing him drink tea and stuff. So when, when I have had scenes with the alien, it's always been quite a powerful experience because it is very frightening. Another creature with a fearsome bite, the predator, features exterior mandibles, a look inspired by beetles and other insects. You're bad. Creator Stan Winston also borrowed details from reptiles and other jungle creatures. There are elements of his face that are somewhat snake-like and, uh, and, and somewhat insect-like. Um, uh, things, and with, with all of these things put together, all these little things that we have seen, but never quite together like this, they excite us and they go, my goodness, I, I have never seen that, that's really neat, and you believe it, and you go, this could be real, because it relates to something you've seen. In contrast, the fierce invaders of Independence Day were created to complement their spacecraft, according to art director Patrick Totopoulos. We created the spacecraft first. Uh, the alien had to work around that. I started to design two different types of alien. One would be more in the tradition of, you know, the, the Giga style, you know, those like big, fantasy creatures. The other one, the smaller one, uh, was more based on the popular imagery, I believe. I mean, you know, big head, small body, but looking a bit like human proportion. Director Roland Emmerich liked both designs. So Totopoulos created an alien inside an alien. The larger creature provided a protective exoskeleton for the smaller alien. So what this is, is actually it's a real organic creature. It's a living creature that the small alien, more clever, and those guys used to travel through space. This is a much stronger creature. It's almost like a bony structure. And the small alien, which is much more fragile, sits on the inside of this thing and basically controls the creature. For the scene where the interior alien awakens during its own autopsy, Tetopolis manipulated a two-foot-tall rod puppet. Shots utilizing the puppet were filmed in front of a green screen. In this process, the green background is replaced when it's digitally combined with all of the elements of the shot. Advancements in visual effects have led to a new generation of extraterrestrials that are generated on computers. That's how the little green stars of the movie Mars Attacks were brought to life. For his salute to the 1950s alien invasion movies, director Tim Burton asked animators at George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic, or ILM, to recreate aliens originally featured on bubblegum cards. They're like beautiful little paintings. That's part of the thing that was attractive about them, that the colors and the way the characters looked and the, and, and the, the style of painting was just so, so nice. Using the cards as a springboard, art director Mark Moore designed computer-generated models for the ILM animators to follow. The biggest challenge on this project was finding that line where it's um, realistic enough so that you feel that this is actually taking place, that these Martians exist, and uh, this technology of theirs is wreaking havoc on Earth. We wanted to make it, you know, using the tools that we have at our disposal now, uh, entertaining enough so that people are actually caught up in the story and with the way the characters are working with everyone else and so perfectly blended with the backgrounds that you'd be sort of astonished as to how this is taking place. 
One of the animator's more bizarre assignments was a scene depicting the Martians' medical experiments on human captives. What's happened is the Martians have abducted um, the, the reporter, Natalie, Sarah Jessica Parker's character, and also abducted her dog. They're in the spaceship and they're basically performing experiments on them, I suppose you'd say. To create the shot, technical director Ben Snow combines a number of separate elements into one seamless image. First, actress Sarah Jessica Parker and a small chihuahua are both filmed barking in front of a blue screen. And we've got to basically take, remove her head and put on her dog's head. The dog's name in the film is Poppy and we've got to graft Poppy's head onto her body. And then in addition to that, we have the doctors, the Martians, who are all dressed in their sort of Martian operating theatre garb and looking very uh, threatening. And they're turning around, interrupted mid-experiment, and they reveal what's happened to her body. Martians have long been Hollywood's favourite invading species. So NASA's 1996 announcement of the possible discovery of a life form found on a Martian meteorite had us riveted. The rock contains organic compounds, organic material, which we believe comes from Mars. Fossils on the rock indicate the presence of an unknown microorganism, magnified here at 100,000 times its actual size. By this means, we've been able to look and see the first organic molecules that we believe come from Mars. Such discoveries are welcome by Hollywood. They can only fuel future cinematic visions. The freedom to create a new species has inspired several generations of filmmakers and provided audiences with many memorable potential alien candidates. It stands in a remote corner of eastern Arizona. Over the years, Apache Sitgreaves National Forest has known the footsteps of Native Americans and the roar of loggers' chainsaws. If woodsman Travis Walton's phenomenal story is true, it was also the landing site of an alien spacecraft. Well, uh, November 5th, 1975. There were seven of us uh, working in the woods, and we had come up the road, and uh, it was starting to get dark. We hadn't come very far when we noticed a light coming up from up to our right. So I was wondering if it maybe you know there was a fire or, or maybe a plane crash. Stop, Mike! Stop the truck! Boom! There it was. I just threw open the door and headed towards this thing because. Because I was thinking that uh, it was just going to be gone in a, in a flash. Uh, and it would be gone before I even got up close to it. But it didn't turn out that way. The substantial evidence supporting Travis Walton's account convinced Hollywood to tell his story in the 1993 movie Fire in the Sky. Reports of alien abduction are not uncommon but they are almost always stories from individuals with no eyewitnesses to corroborate the claim. This was not true with Travis Walton. Oh my God. More than 20 years later, the six other loggers in the woods that night still swear they saw Travis approach a hovering metallic disc. Mike Rogers was driving the truck. I remember this very clearly. This, this is, this is a, a memory that's just etched, it just burned deeply into all of us. I mean, there, there's no forgetting any minor detail of this thing. Rogers drew this illustration of the hovering object. This thing was 20, 25, maybe even 30 feet in diameter. It was saucer shaped, or kind of like a white dome on top, just barely peeking over the top of it. Parts of it were lighted and parts of it were metallic or semi-reflective. When I saw this thing, it was, it was a real shock, and it just got worse from there. Something came out of the bottom of that thing. Whatever it was, it hit him in the head and chest area and blew him backwards, uh, just like an explosion had gone off in front of him. Wham! 
Stunned, afraid Walton was dead, and thinking they might be next, Rogers and the others drove off through the woods. This thing lifted up and just shot off in a streak towards the northeast, just like that. That was gone, just a blur. The men returned a few minutes later to look for Walton, but found no sign of him. When they reported the incident, police suspected they invented the story to cover up Walton's murder. They conducted a pretty broad search that very day, and they didn't find a thing. And for four days, there was never a sign of him. When I was returned, uh, I found out that I'd been missing for five days and six hours, even though to me it seemed like just a matter of hours. News of Walton's disappearance had already attracted sensational stories in the press. But his own account of this missing period is stranger than any reporter's speculation. I didn't regain consciousness quickly, and I was disoriented. I didn't know where I was. There was a light above me. When I looked at it, it, it really hurt my eyes. You know, my vision finally cleared, and I got where I could see. I saw this, this creature standing over me, and I just became hysterical. I just flipped out instantly. <laughs> These illustrations of the alien abductors are based on Walton's recollections. They reveal two different types of alien beings on the craft, including creatures that are remarkably humanoid. Walton's experience ended when the craft deposited him on a road running past the forest. I looked around, I was outdoors. I'd been lying beside the highway. Some psychologists say stories of alien abductions are hallucinations triggered by extreme stress to the brain. And in the years since the event, Rogers and Walton have heard every rationale from skeptics out to discredit their story. I don't care if they believe. I mean, I've done what I can. I've, I've taken two lie detector tests, the only two I've ever taken in my life. Both of them on this subject, I've passed them both. One of the things that was just silly, you know, is they were claiming that this was some kind of a, a delusion. Well, how do seven people have an identical hallucination? And, you know, it doesn't happen. People raised on horror movies and Hollywood special effects. Sometimes I get the impression that I don't understand the incredible fear that I was experiencing. But to look into the face of a, a being of that sort is absolutely the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced in my life. <laughs> on March 2nd, 1972, NASA launched Pioneer 10, history's most distant human-made object. The first spacecraft to leave our solar system, it travels at 30,000 miles an hour. Built to far outlive its human creators, Pioneer 10 carries a plaque with a message to extraterrestrials about its home planet. I know that we sent a message out there, and I believe there's a strong possibility that there'll be an answer one day. Hollywood has often speculated about how the announcement of alien contact would be handled. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Drew Pearson. We bring you this special radio television broadcast in order to give you the very latest information on an amazing phenomenon, the arrival of a space ship in Washington. Typically, the news is followed by scenes of mass panic in the streets. If the day of first contact occurs, how would we react? The artillery doesn't penetrate. The level of panic we experience is likely to depend on how the story is reported. According to Van Gordon Sauter, former president of the CBS Network News Division, this is not a job journalists would take lightly. This would be the most consequential, emotionally driven story in the history of what we would call the news business. Panic that sweeps around the globe as the great... If you are an inherently paranoid individual, and a certain segment of the American population is, you would be convinced that doom was around the corner, that these people were on the way here to fulfill H.G. Wells, 
and any number of those science fiction predictors of Armageddon. It'll be big news, that's for sure. I don't think there'll be panic in the streets because I think most people in this country believe we've already heard them. I mean, there's sort of a precondition for our discovery. Are we preconditioned? Thanks to Hollywood, we may have been preparing for the aliens' arrival for decades. There's something timeless, I guess, about the notion that there may be other people out there and that some of them may be visiting us. Film historian Leonard Maltin has been observing Hollywood's fascination with extraterrestrials for more than 20 years. It never seems to wear out its welcome. And you'd think somehow that with the progress of decades and the progress of scientific investigation, that this would become less interesting or, or would be obliterated by science. Instead, it seems to be proliferating. Interest in extraterrestrial visitors is not just limited to movies. Well-known sites with UFO connections are trying to attract more human visitors. Rachel, Nevada, the nearest town to the infamous Area 51, is candidly looking for tourist dollars. Coinciding with the release of the film Independence Day, the state of Nevada renamed Route 51 the Extraterrestrial Highway. It's even prepared a vacation brochure encouraging sightseers to take the E.T. experience. For its part, Roswell, New Mexico, site of the famed 1947 reports of a crashed spacecraft, is now the home of the UFO Museum and Research Center. We have a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation out about the crashes in 1947. At this point in time, we actually feel there were at least three cra crashes in this area during that week. And so we have to be very specific in providing the information and the correct information to the people involved. Among the exhibits is a model of the alien featured in the movie Roswell. The setup is basically kind of like the autopsy that has been talked about. We don't know, nothing is, has ever come forth as far as the autopsy, other than we know that it took place at the military base hospital. Hollywood's treatment of extraterrestrials is not passed off as mere fantasy here. This is our history as far as Roswell is concerned. Hollywood does things Hollywood has to do. And even though some of the things are not based on research, um, are not based on anything credible at times, they are still getting the stories and the questions out into the public's minds. And that works. These things, we don't know what it's like yet. Hollywood helps us conceive those ideas. A planet doomed to destruction. Thanks to Hollywood's imagination, Alien civilizations continue to fascinate. We have been taught to accept this, and maybe that's the whole plan. So that in the next few years, when they say, oh, by the way, aliens have crashed and they're here living among us. OK, fine, good, great, let's meet them. And it won't be the pandemonium that, that could have happened years ago. Well, it's an interesting idea to think that the government is slowly leaking things to prepare us for the final contact or confrontation with alien beings. Um, actually, I think what is happening right now is that there's just a tremendous interest in it, and Hollywood is always interested in what people are interested in because they know they can make money. If there are alien life forms, and if they do come to Earth, I hope that it isn't these movies that have given us any idea of what to do <laughs> because I think then we're going to be in real trouble. <laughs> but even exaggerated depictions validate the efforts of those who are professionally seeking extraterrestrials. And it also allows all of us the chance to be explorers of the final frontier, fulfilling our need for adventure. People have always wanted somebody outside themselves that, that can come in and influence their lives for the better usually and uh, in the past that would be uh, angels maybe organized religion uh, leprechauns i don't know what now in the late 20th century it's it's the aliens 
People want uh, somebody to, or something to believe in, perhaps. The opportunity movies give us to collectively dream is sure to keep these universally popular stories coming. People of Earth, attention. Should we awake one day to learn something is indeed headed our way, Hollywood's visions will provide our frame of reference. We're all gonna sit here and say, boy, do I really hope that this is E.T. and it's not some disease-bearing, malevolent force that is going to eradicate life as we know it. The questions movies have raised will also continue to linger. The Area 51 and how people have caught on, even amongst uh, the government people, uh, secrets don't stay secret forever. Until the day comes that the truth about extraterrestrials can be resolved, Hollywood will keep us watching the skies. <laughs>